Amen. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. Should be happy to be here. Um, we're going to get started. The visitors will retire behind the rail. We can move on to our invocation. And to give our invocation this morning, the chair recognizes Pastor Myra Maxwell of the Trinity United Church. She is here today as the guest of Councilman Johnson. I would ask all members, guests, and visitors to please rise. Good morning. Good morning. Truly, it is an honor today for me to bring this invocation. And I want to especially thank um, God first and Councilman Johnson, who has been an inspiration and encouragement uh, throughout the city. So we give thanks. Let us look to the Lord. Almighty, loving, and wise God, as we come before you on this day, we come with a spirit of thanksgiving. Thanking you for giving us another opportunity, Lord, for what we may have not done correctly on yesterday, that we'll be able to get it right on today. Almighty God, as we come, we humble ourselves before your throne, thanking and praising you, Lord God, for the 17 members of council that you have handpicked to serve in this city, to touch the lives of the people, to be a voice for those who feel voiceless. Almighty God, we pray that you will just continue to bless each community. Walk through, Lord God, every neighborhood. Touch and heal and deliver, Lord God, as we face issues of substance abuse and violence in our communities. Oh God, we pray, Lord God, that you will empower our council members. Lord God, first with a spirit of love, that they will love the people that they serve in the communities where they serve. Almighty God, we ask that you will empower them with a spirit of wisdom that they may do all that you have tasked for them to do. Almighty God, we pray that you will empower them with a spirit of faith. Lord God, that they will continue to know that you are leading, that you are guiding them, that they may do all that you have for them to do. Almighty God, we, press, we pray that you will touch those who will present on today. For, Lord God, there are many that work in our communities and serve, Lord God. We pray that you will touch, Lord God, the grassroots organizations, Lord God, and the larger organizations as well. That we'll work together to do what's necessary to keep this city great. Almighty God, we give you praise, Lord God, and thanks, Lord God, for just being with us today. So guide and touch all that will be said and done in this council session today. And Lord God, we would be remiss if we didn't ask a special prayer over that young man and his child that were shot in the streets of Philadelphia. So Lord God, bless them, Lord God, that they will be restored to good health. And Lord God, we thank you for your power, your presence, and your guidance. We ask these things in the name of your Son, and our spirit says, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor, for those very inspiring words. Council Biddies.
Thank you. Uh, at this moment, the chair recognizes Councilwoman Reynolds Brown. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. President. And keeping uh, with our protocol to welcome special guests, it is a thrill for me this morning to present to some and introduce to others several women who have led the way by being sisters in solar. And I want to um, ask Councilwoman Parker to pay particular attention because she is a soror of ours. It's a thrill for me to welcome Rose McKinney James Esquire, Chair of the Board of Directors for the American Association of Blacks in Energy. She and the entire board is here, and we want to welcome them to the city of brotherly love and sisterly effectiveness. <laughs> She is uh, joined today to be our keynote speaker for our Sisters in Solar first annual luncheon, which talks about STEM and encouraging women of color to go into these non-traditional fields. Uh, we will also be welcoming George Washington Carver High School students from the School of Engineering and Science, the Science Leadership Academy, and the OIC Smart Energy Solar class. Thank you, Nancy Mifflin. Rose McKinney James, please stand up so we can welcome you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilwoman, and thank you for being here today. Really appreciate it. All right, our next order of business is the approval of the journal of the meeting of Thursday, April 12, 2018, and the chair recognizes Councilman Greenlee. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the journal of the meeting of Thursday, April 12, 2018, be approved. Second. Thank you. It has been moved and probably second that the journal of the meeting of Thursday, April 12, 2018, stand approved. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, ayes have it, and that journal is approved. And the next order of business is request for leave of absence, and the chair recognizes Councilman Heenan. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the majority, a leave of absence is requested for Councilmember Jones. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, the record shall reflect. Leave shall be granted. And the chair now recognizes Councilman O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the Republicans, there are no requests for leave of absence. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. At this time, I would like to dispense with the regular order of business, and I would like to thank everyone who has taken time out of their busy day to come down to witness their government in action. Uh, we hope you'll stay here today. Um, it's a knowledgeable one, but more importantly, a pleasurable one, so much so that you come back again. So again, thank you so much for being here. At this time, the chair recognizes Councilwoman Blackwell, who will present a resolution recognizing and honoring Lynette Brown So on the occasion of her retirement. With Ms. Brown so and those accompanying her, please join the councilwoman at the podium. Everybody. All right. <laughs> and joining the councilwoman, everybody? everybody. We have all members of council. <laughs> Mr. President, this is really a pleasure for us. So many people have known Lynette over the years in so many ways through so many activities that everybody's up here to share in certainly um, our best wishes for her, our thank yous and our congratulations to her for all that she's done and especially for her service to Community College of Philadelphia. So we are happy to present this resolution, again signed by everybody. Resolution recognizing and honoring Lynette Brown So on the occasion of her retirement for her committed service to Community College of Philadelphia and for her many accomplishments that have benefited the city of Philadelphia. Whereas, Lynette Brown So graduated from West Philadelphia High School in 1968. She received a bachelor's of science, a degree in bachelor's of science administration from Antioch University in 1979, and a master's of so MSS in policy, which is master's in 
Social Sciences in Policy Planning and Development from Bryn Mawr College in 1981 and. We are excited about her next act. Whereas in 1980, she founded Ellen Brown Management Group, a certified minority female-owned consulting firm that provides professional services to corporations, nonprofits, and governmental entities, and whereas Lynette Brownso is also a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Philadelphia Alumni Chapter Incorporated. And whereas her expertise in organizational development board governance, marketing, and crisis communications has made her a highly sought after board member. She currently serves on the board of numerous organizations, including but not limited to the Philadelphia Tribune Company Incorporated, Hahnemann Hospital, Hahnemann University Hospital, NHS Enterprises Inc., and the board of City Trusts, of where she serves Girard College via her committee assignment. She's a member also of the Forum of Executive Women and a convener of the Forum for a Better Pennsylvania. And? Whereas she served as chair of the board of directors of the consortium, a behavioral health or healthcare organization that pioneered the strategy of balancing the input of community leaders and medical experts. In 2007, the consortium named its newest service center the Lynette M. Brown Center of Hope and? Whereas Brown so has served Community College of Philadelphia as a consultant, program director, and as vice president of marketing and government relations for more than 25 years. As a member of the president's cabinet at the college, she oversaw advertising, public relations, creative services, pu uh, publications, special events, and government and community relations for the college. And Whereas she developed and strengthened partnerships nationally and locally, working with the American Association of Community Colleges and the White House to support free tuition programs at community colleges and to sustain funding for Pell Grants and. Whereas Lynette Brownso has also lent her knowledge to those in government. She helped with the transition teams for both Mayor Edward Rundell and Michael Nutter. She was later appointed as Deputy Mayor of Administration for the Rundell Administration and. She also chaired the Philadelphia Zoning Board of Adjustment during a citywide change. In 2012, she was nominated by Mayor Nutter and was approved by City Council to become the Commissioner and Board Chair of the Philadelphia Housing Authority and... Whereas, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf appointed Brownso to the Pennsylvania Workforce Investment Board which works with state educational policies to build a strong workforce development system. She has served as a member since 2015 and? Whereas Brownsell has received numerous honors and awards and recognitions, including the Sammy Award for Outstanding Community Service by the Laborers International Union of North America, the Communications of the Year by the National Council for Marketing and Public Relations, and the Energy for the Community Award from PICO. She was recognized by her peers as one of the 100 distinguished alumni at Bryn Mawr College, and named five consecutive years as one of the most city's most influential Philadelphians by the Philadelphia Tribune, and Whereas, Lynette Brownso is a lifelong Philadelphian and has worked in both the public and private sectors throughout her long and fruitful career. She has dedicated her talents to the service of others, and we thank her for the time and energy she has devoted to help our city. And I also want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, my big sister, Lynette Brownso, who when I first got involved in this process of politics, she taught me the art of war, political organizing um, across the city of Philadelphia. And so now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the City of Philadelphia hereby recognizes and honors the Net Brown So 
on the occasion of her retirement for her commitment to service to Community College of Philadelphia and for her many accomplishments that have benefited the city of Philadelphia. Further resolved that an engrossed copy of this resolution be presented to Ms. Brown So as a sincere expression of the Council of the City of Philadelphia's gratitude, admiration, and recognition. Congratulations and all the best. Good morning. My name is Juvencio Gonzalez, and I'm a special assistant for the Lieutenant Governor, Mike Stack. I have a citation on behalf of the Lieutenant Governor, and, and today I said to Lynette, Lynette, I'm going to miss you. She said, I'm not going anywhere. You can continue calling me. So I feel really relieved. From the Lieutenant Governor, in recognition of Lynette Brown's soul, as a Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I am honored to join with your family, friends, and colleagues to congratulate you on your retirement from Community College of Philadelphia and to celebrate your 22 years of service to the college and many more years to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. During the 20 years, 22 years that you dedicated to making a higher education more accessible, you have been an example of how others should conduct their lives and careers I thank you for your consistency in meeting many challenges over the years and for your dedication to getting the job done. I hope you can look back at, on your career with pride and fulfillment, knowing that you made a difference in the lives of many of your colleagues and countless citizens. Your valuable contributions will be greatly missed, but the impact of your work will be felt for years to come. On this occasion, I share, share with you the words of uh, Sir, Winston Churchill, who said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. On behalf of all, of all Pennsylvanians, I would like to commend you and your wonderful career at, the, at Community College. Congratulations and best wishes for much health, happiness, as you enjoy time and family and friends during your retirement. Mike Stack, Lieutenant Governor, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Thank you. Congratulations. And at this time, the chair recognizes Lynette Brown, so. Thank you, President Clark, and thank you, Councilwoman Blackwell, for this resolution. I am honored, I am grateful, and I am thankful. Most of you city council people I've worked with way before you became city council members. We've worked in the community and making our communities a better place and empowering other people to make a difference. As I said the evening of my retirement event, I am very clear that everything that I've done, I haven't done it alone. So thank you to the members of the college family, to those of you who are here from the various boards, and I know there's a joke, how many boards is she on? <laughs> <laughs> and my friends and my fellow government relations folks who we donned these walls and in this room on Thursdays together. And I can't forget to thank all the staff people for the council people because we know you're the ones that help us get our work done. All of you have touched my life in some way and you have enriched my life. This resolution is an affirmation that all of the long days, nights, weekends have been worth it. And it affirms that I've been able to demonstrate my passion to make a better place for my people, my community, and our city. And I am clear that I stand on the shoulders of many great women and men. And I understand that I have a responsibility to do what others have done for me, to strengthen the next generation, and to pass the baton. And because I have had someone who's done that for me, lots of people, but there's always one that I always have to mention, and that's the Honorable Hardy Williams, a man who gave me as a little girl the ability to think differently, to look at things in, from a different lens, and to care about people in my community in a way that is sustainable. These lessons help me understand the common bond between all of us, and I will forever not forget what Hardy Williams has instilled in me. I thank all of you for your support, and I hope that you will continue to support me as I transition back into uh, LM Brown Management Group. 
marketing thing. <laughs> and thank you for this affirmation, affirmation um, that I'm doing what I was here to be put on this earth to do. And I want to just say that, as he said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to continue the fight. I'm going to keep on working with all of you to make our community better. I want my legacy to be a list, a list of all the people that I've helped, all the organizations I've helped live their mission, all the legislation and, pa and policies that have opened access for people who look like me and therefore other people. So I appreciate all of you, and I appreciate you appreciating me. Thank you. Thank you, Council will be at ease. Thank you and congratulations. At this time, the chair recognizes Councilman O, who presented a resolution recognizing and honoring the 2017 winners of Philly Live Center Stage. With, with Ms. Deanna Williams and those accompanying her, please join the Councilman at the podium. Thank you very much, Council President. I would ask the winners of the 2017 PHL Live Center Stage 
to stand in front of the uh, podium. That would be Del P, Image, Black Horse Motel, Jonathan Marvin and the Philly Reggae Band, Jason Ager, David Live, DJ Soulchild, Activate. All right, would you step in front of us? And uh, I'd like to just recognize the so people who are coming to stand on stage behind me. Uh, if you're in music, you know who they are. If you don't, these are really the uh, leaders and heavyweights of the music industry in our region. And also the sponsors who have allowed this act activity, PHL Live, to move forward. Um, they are Harold Honickman, Deanna Williams, Dr. Louis Anthony DeLise, Ron DeSilvio, Brent Porsche, International DJ Casper, David Ivory, Marilyn Rodriguez, Frank Knuckles, Cindy Drew, E. Daniels, Joseph Conyers, Lovett Hines, Justin Nordell, Simply Monica, Jimmy DeSaint, Stephanie Seipel, Craig White, Bernie Resnick, Randall Jefferson, Rashawn Lucas, Jeff Duperon, um, and Justin Minetti. All right. So when we begin, let me just say that PHL Live Center Stage is a, an effort to recognize those uh, who are gifted with musical talent and ability and to support them by recognizing them and uh, pro providing them with a platform. Uh, I don't have any money. It is uh, donated to me through uh, corporations like Comcast, uh, National Brands, um, and, and uh, Coors Light, our primary sponsor, and the donation of our music venues, and these outstanding judges, Grammy Award winners, Grammy nominated, uh, uh, writers, engineers, producers, radio personalities who donate all their time uh, in this uh, arduous process. And so the winners, and I'll ask them again, would you stand in front of us so we can all see who you are? Uh, that would be... They're, they're behind me, but step up in front. Yes. Lindsay Tucker So, Del P, Image, uh, Black Horse Motel, Jonathan Marvin, and the Philly Reggae Band, Jason Ager, David Live, DJ Soulchild, Activate. Thank you very much. Let's give them all a party round of applause. A kudos to Councilman O for celebrating Philly's own rich, rich cultural and arts talent. Whereas Philly Live Center Stage is a music initiative established by Councilman David O as chairman of the Committee on Global Opportunities and the Creative Innovative Economy. And whereas Philly Live Center Stage provides local musicians with exciting opportunities to be discovered and promoted to further achieve success right here in Philadelphia. And whereas Philly Live Center Stage performances and awards show are structured across 10 different genres of music, bringing diverse musicians together. The 10 different genres are rock, hip hop, jazz, classical, gospel, country folk, world, pop, R&B, and DJ. In addition, a People's Choice Award is selected as an 11th category. And whereas this year's finalists performed live in prominent local venues, including World Cafe Live, Milk Boy, Hard Rock Cafe, Reformation Lutheran Church, The Clef Club of Jazz, Milk Boy South Street, Settlement Music School, School Kung Fu Necktie, Voltage Lounge, and William Street Common. And Whereas, the final winners for each genre, announced in December at the Trocadero Theater during the fourth annual PHL Live Center Stage Award Show, was decided by judges who were considered experts in the industry. And whereas, the People's Choice Award is voted on by the audience before and during the award show at the Trocadero Theater. And whereas, the winning artists from each genre receive top prizes such as $1,000 in cash, studio recording time, music videos, documentaries, and openings at major concerts. And whereas the 2017 winner of the rock category is Saravo, and whereas the 2017 winner of the hip hop category is Del P, 
and whereas the 2017 winner of the jazz category is the Jost Project, and whereas the 2017 winner of gospel in, in the, of the gospel category is image, <laughs> whereas the 2017 winner of country folk category is Black Horse Motel. Uh, the 2017 winner is of the world category is Jonathan Marvin and the Philly Reggae Band. And whereas the 2017 winner of the pop category is Jason Ager. And, did I forget one? Oh. Whereas the 2017 winner of the classical category is Bethany Brooks and Samuel Nebu. Okay. Whereas the 2017 winner of the R&B category is David Live, whereas the 2017 winner of the DJ category is DJ Soulchild, and whereas the 2017 winner of the People's Choice category is Activate. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Philadelphia that it hereby recognizes and honors the 2017 winners of PHL Live Center Stage. And the chair recognizes Ms. Williams for remarks. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. all. I'm Deanna Williams from 100.3 WRMB Radio 1 Philadelphia. I'm also the proud chair of the 20th anniversary of the Marian Anderson Award. And I am the former president of the Philadelphia Grammy chapter. And most importantly, a proud supporter of PHL Live. I have worked with Councilman O from pretty much day one. So it is an honor to stand before you on behalf of the music industry community in our city. And before you stand and behind me, talented citizens of one of the greatest cities on planet Earth, the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection. I thank President Clark, our council people for their support of this endeavor. You are affording an opportunity to emerging artists to be seen, heard, celebrated, and in some cases, rewarded with a cash reward, studio time, and other prizes that will enable them to continue growing their careers into professional careers and prayerfully full-time musicians in the music industry. FYI, the music industry remains a multi-billion dollar industry and our city, considering our status back to early colonial days, we are a music mecca in every single genre of music that you can imagine. Philadelphia excels. We remain that place for commerce, arts, culture in our city. Most of the touring bands that you see from Jay-Z to Justin Timberlake, the musicians are from our area. So we are funneling on an international level ambassadors of our great city. So on behalf of the music community in the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection, we thank you Councilman O, we thank City Council, Sister Blondell, who I've had a chance to work with over the years. And I want to take a personal moment to say congratulations to Lynette Brown So, a dedicated daughter of the city of Philadelphia. Thank you all for your support. Continue to encourage music from our great music mecca. Council of Ladies. Thank you. 
Thank you and congratulations. Our next order of business is communications and the chair requests that the Sergeant of Arms deliver the messages from the mayor to the chief clerk. Mr. Decker, please read those messages. To the President and members of the Council of the City of Philadelphia, I am pleased to advise you that on April 18, 2018, I signed all the bills which were passed by Council at its session on April 5, 2018. And I, am and I am transmitting herewith for the consideration of your honorable body an ordinance amending Section 2 of an ordinance, Bill Number 160145, approved April 19, 2016, entitled An Ordinance Authorizing the Revision of Lines and Grades on a Portion of City Plan Number 44 by placing on the City Plan 37th Street from Market Street to Filbert Street and from Filbert Street to Warren Street, Cuthbert Street from 37th Street to 38th Street, north of Filbert Street, and Warren Street from 37th Street to 38th Street, all under certain terms and conditions, by extending the period for compliance with the terms and conditions stated therein and an ordinance approving the 15th Amendment of the Redevelopment Proposal for the Cecil B. Moore Avenue Urban Renewal Area, being the area generally bounded by 15th Street on the east, Jefferson Street on the south, 19th Street on the west, and Montgomery Avenue on the north, including the 15th Amendment to the Urban Renewal Plan, and an ordinance approving the 42nd Amendment of the Redevelopment Proposal for the Model City's Urban Renewal Area, being the area beginning on the northwest corner of Front Street and Spring Garden Street, including the 34th Amendment to the Urban Renewal Plan all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you, Mr. Decker. Do you have any additional communications? I have none, Mr. President. Thank you very much. These messages will be printed in today's journal. And our next order of business is the introduction of bills and resolutions, and the chair recognizes Councilwoman Reynolds-Brown. Mr. President, I'd like to uh, highlight one resolution introduced by council lead in introducers are, uh, forgive me, lead sponsors are Councilman Kenyatta Johnson and Councilwoman Sherelle Parker, who chairs Labor and Industry, and is co-sponsored by Council Members Gim and Councilman Derek Green. And uh, so ultimately, I'm introducing three resolutions this morning. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilwoman. A privilege resolution recognizing April 22, 2018 as Earth Day in the city of Philadelphia today's calendar and a privilege resolution authorizing the Committee on Labor and Civil Service to hold hearings on the effectiveness of implicit bias and racial equity trainings for employees of the City of Philadelphia today's calendar and a privilege resolution recognizing April 26 2018 as 50 50 day in the City of Philadelphia also on today's calendar chair recognizes Councilwoman Blackwell thank you mr. president today I have no bills or resolutions 
Thank, Thank you, Councilwoman. Chair recognizes Councilman Greenlee. Thank you, Mr. President. Today I offer one bill on your behalf. Thank you, Councilman. An ordinance amending Chapter 16400 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Vacant and Surplus Properties to allow property dispositions by the Philadelphia Land Bank. For the committee, Chair recognizes Councilman Heenan. Thank you, Mr. President. I have no bills or resolutions today. Thank you, Councilman. Chair recognizes Councilman Johnson. He's not here. Chair recognizes Councilwoman Keona Sanchez. Thank you, Council President. I have a resolution co sponsored by Councilman Jones Green, Councilwoman Blondell Reynolds Brown Bass, and Blackwell, and Councilman Green. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. A privilege resolution authorizing the Committee on Appropriations and the Committee on Transportation and Public Utilities to conduct hearings to develop more inclusive, transparent, and efficient processes and methods for the City of Philadelphia's procurement of professional services, capital programs, and commodities. And Today's calendar, <coughs> and the Chair recognizes Councilman Johnson. Council President, no bills or resolutions for the day. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Chair recognizes Councilman Green. Thank you, Council President. I have one non privilege resolution. Thank you, Councilman. A non privilege resolution calling upon the Congress of the United States to pass S. 1689, legislation offered by Senator Cory Booker to federally decriminalize and otherwise improve public policy with relation to marijuana. And that will be on next week's calendar. Chair recognizes Councilwoman Parker. Thank you, Mr. President. I have one non privileged resolution, and it's co sponsored by Council Members Blondell Reynolds Brown, Derek Green, Cindy Bass, and I wish to be heard after the title is read. Thank you, Councilwoman. A non privileged resolution commending the Pennsylvania House of Representatives on the passage of legislative package aimed at helping grandparents raising grandchildren and encouraging the Senate to pass this legislation into law. Chair again recognizes Councilwoman Parker. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I just wanted to take this opportunity uh, to lift up, up two of my former colleagues, uh, and that is uh, State Representative Eddie Day Pashinsky, who is a Democrat from Luzerne County, and Representative Kathy Watson, who is a Republican from Bucks County. On April the 17th, the Pennsylvania House passed and it moved to the Senate a package, a bipartisan package of bills aimed at supporting grandparents raising grandchildren. It's a legislative packet, uh, package of bills. Um, and for the record, um, Mr. President, the reason why this issue in particular is of importance to me is uh, I'm happy that they say it this way, grandparents raising grandchildren, because I was raised by my, my grandparents, but now the term that is often used, it is referred to as kinship care. And uh, while I don't have any data in front of me showing that there is a statistically significant difference um, uh, that we can prove that there's a correlation or causation with opioid abuse, lack of unemployment or mental health, and the increase in the number of children who are being raised by someone other than their biological parents in their families. For those of us who have a direct connection to the people we represent, we know that we are seeing this phenomenon on the rise. And so I just want to commend these two legislators in particular and uh, colleagues uh, in the House for moving uh, this package over to the Senate. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilwoman. That will be on next week's calendar. Chair recognizes Councilman Don. Good morning, Mr. President. No bills or resolutions today. Thank you, Councilman. Chair recognizes Councilwoman Gim. Good morning, Council President. I have one bill today co-sponsored by Council Members Jones and Johnson. Thank you, Councilwoman. An ordinance amending Chapter 93500 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Fair Criminal Record Screening Standards by adding a section providing for a prohibition on consideration of or inquiry about an applicant's juvenile records at any stage of the employment or licensing process and adding definitions. Refer to committee. Chair recognizes Councilman Taubman. Thank you, Council President. I have no bills or resolutions this morning. 
Thank you, Councilman. Chair recognizes Councilman O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. President. I have no bills or resolutions. Thank you, Councilman. Chair recognizes Councilman Squill. Thank you, Mr. President. I offer one bill. Thank you, Councilman. An ordinance amending Section 9 of an ordinance, Bill Number 150377, approved June 18, 2015, as amended by Bill Number 160566, approved June 16, 2016, and Bill Number 170566, approved July 11, 2017, entitled An Ordinance Authorizing the Construction, Ownership, and Maintenance of Various Encroachments into the Right of Way of Market Street, Filbert Street, 11th Street, 10th Street, 9th Street, and 8th Street, and authorizing the assignment of certain rights with respect to an overhead pedestrian bridge above Filbert Street, west of the house line of 9th Street, to be assigned all under certain terms and conditions, by further authorizing the Streets Department to approve encroachments consistent with plans approved by the Philadelphia City Planning Commission and the Phil City of Philadelphia Art Commission, by extending the time for compliance with the authorization conditions therein. That will be referred to the appropriate committee. Chair recognizes Councilwoman Bass. Thank you, Mr. President. I offer no bills or resolutions. Thank you, Councilwoman. Chair recognizes Councilman O. Thank you, Mr. President. I offer three privilege resolutions co-sponsored by council members Blackwell, Bass, Don Green, Heenan, Parker, and Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. A privilege resolution proclaiming the week of April 27, 2018 to May 5, 2018 as the eighth annual Philly Tech Week presented by Comcast and honoring the broad street, the broad and vibrant Philadelphia technology community. This week's calendar. And a privilege resolution recognizing May 2018 as Asian American and Pacific Islanders Heritage Month in Philadelphia to celebrate and commemorate the proud heritage of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and their important contributions to enhancing the city's culture, economy, and the founding ideals of independence and democracy. And this week's calendar. And a privilege resolution commemorating the 60th anniversary of the death of Inho O and the response by his parents offering forgiveness to the teenage murderers requesting that the juveniles receive the most generous treatment possible allowed by law and establishing a fund to be used for their religious educational vocational and social guidance and that will also be on this week's calendar that concludes our introduction of bills and resolutions and we will now hear our reports from the committee. And the chair recognizes Councilwoman McKeona Sanchez for a report from the Committee on Appropriations. Thank you, Mr. President. The Committee on Appropriations reports one bill with a favorable recommendation. Thank you. Mr. Decker, please read the report. To the President, to members of the Council of the City of Philadelphia, the Committee on Appropriations, to which is referred Bill Number 180264, entitled an ordinance authorizing transfers and appropriations for fiscal year 2018 from the General Fund, certain all city offices, departments, boards, and commissions, the Grants Revenue Fund, certain all city offices, departments, boards, and commissions, to the General Fund, certain all city, city offices, departments, boards, and commissions. Respectfully reports that it is considered and amended the same and returns the attached bill to Council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Decker. And the chair again recognizes Councilwoman Keona Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the rules of council be suspended so as to permit first reading this day of, of bill number 180264. Thank you. It has been moved and properly second that the rules of council be suspended so as to permit first reading this day of bills number 180264. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. And this will be placed on our free first reading calendar today. The next order of business is the consideration of the calendar. I note that the bill just reported from committee with suspension of the rules have been deemed to have had a first reading. This bill will be placed on our second reading and final passes calendar in our next session of council. As there are no additional bills on the first reading, the chair recognizes Councilman Heenan for the motion concerning the bills on the second reading and final passes. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the rules of council be suspended to permit the use of a consent agenda to consider the following bills on second reading and final passage calendar. Bill numbers 180003, 180099, 180169, 180172, 180173, 170925, 170926, 171, 117, 180004, 180079, 180080, 180101, 
and 180263. Second. Thank you, Ms. Bermuda. Second it that the rules of council be suspended to permit the use of a consent agenda to consider the bills just read by Councilman Heenan. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. The motion carries and we will consider the consent agenda shortly. Chair again recognizes Councilman Heenan for the purpose of calling up bills and resolutions on the regular second reading and final passes calendar. Thank you, Mr. President. In addition to the bills being considered on the consent agenda, the following resolutions of bills are being called up for the second reading final passage calendars today. Bill numbers 180303, 180322, 180352, 180353, 180356, 180121, 180122, 180147. All other bills and resolutions are being held. Thank you, Councilman. Before considering these bills and resolutions on our final passage calendar today, uh, we will have our public comment session. It will go as follows. If you are interested in testifying on a bill or resolution that is on the final passage calendar today, um, if you have not already done so, you may sign up at the table to my left. When your name is called, you will go to the middle of the council chambers. There's a podium, and on that podium is a device. When the light turns green on that device, it will be your time to speak. When the light turns yellow, you will have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. When the light turns red, we'd ask that you please adhere to our guidelines and conclude your remarks. You will be given three minutes to testify. Mr. Decker, please call the first name on the list. Rob Graff, commenting on 180218. Good morning. Good afternoon, Council President Clark and members of the Philadelphia City Council. My name is Robert Graff. I manage the Office of Energy and Climate Change Initiatives at the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. DVRPC serves the city of Philadelphia and has eight surrounding Pennsylvania and New Jersey counties. Councilman Squilla represents the city of Philadelphia on DVRPC's board. I'm honored to provide testimony in favor of Bill 180218, which discontinues the approval of new reserved electric vehicle parking spaces on the street in front of electric vehicle owners' homes and eliminates the existing spaces by 2033. DVRPC has been involved in electric vehicle work for the past decade. In 2012, DVRPC released Ready to Roll, Southeastern Pennsylvania's Regional Electric Vehicle Action Plan. We are currently working with researchers at the Plug-in Hybrid and Electric Vehicle Research Center at University of California, Davis, to develop tools to help us understand how electric vehicle ownership and charging in our region is likely to evolve. I also serve as DVRPC's rep representative on the Drive Electric Pennsylvania Coalition. For the past year, I served on the city's electric vehicle policy task force, established to develop a long-term, sustainable approach to promote electric vehicle use in Philadelphia. The task force's policy recommendations released in March include freezing the electric vehicle parking space program. As part of its EV work, DVRPC receives detailed registration data from PennDOT for every vehicle in the five counties of southeastern Pennsylvania. The most recent data we have from November 2017 shows 733 electric vehicles in Philadelphia. This bill affects only the 68 electric vehicles that are parked and charged on public streets in reserved overnight curbside parking spaces in front of their owners' homes. That is, it affects just 7% of the 733 electric vehicles registered in the city. Furthermore, the owners of those 68 electric vehicles will continue to be provided reserved overnight parking on the street in front of their homes until 2033, as long as they own or lease an electric vehicle. This seemed fair to the task force members. Note that the city still allows residents to install curbside EV charger in front of their homes. However, they will not be provided with a reserved spot. EV owners have several charging choices if they do not have dedicated off-street parking. Rent a parking space and to park, rent a space to park and charge their electric vehicle, charge at their place of work or other location to which they drive regularly, or charge at a public charging station. The task force report recommends nine strategies to foster these and other options for EV owners. Otis has started has stated it will actively pursue these strategies and report regularly on their implementation status. Thank you for your attention. I would be happy to respond to any questions you might have. Thank you, sir. Bill West. Commenting on 180218. 
Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Bill West. Uh, my colleague Eileen Wilder uh, and I are co-chairs of the Parking Committee for the Philadelphia Crosstown Coalition, a group of 32 registered community organizations from across the city. Uh, Eileen couldn't be here today, uh, but I am here to urge you to vote in favor of Bill number 180218, which addresses the closing down of the current curbside char charging program for electric vehicles. Eileen and I served as community members of the city's electric vehicle policy task force, which conducted a broad inquiry into the potential for bringing large numbers of electric vehicles to the city. The report of the task force contains a large number of recommendations and frankly is a very encouraging document. Although replacing gasoline and diesel powered vehicles with electric vehicles on a one-to-one -one basis would do nothing to alleviate the problems of traffic and parking congestion in the city, it would substantially improve the quality of the air we breathe and also give us a quieter city. One of the jobs of the task force was to figure out what to do with the current electric vehicle parking space program which provides residents with dedicated curbside parking spaces in front of their homes, where they may install chargers and recharge their electric vehicles. Although this program is certainly well-intentioned, there is simply not enough space on our streets to accommodate the large number of electric vehicles that the task force envisions. To use a piece of jargon, the program is not scalable. In our opinion, Bill 180218 faithfully renders into legislative language the recommendations of the task force that relate to the current on-street charging program. I should emphasize that the task force reached its conclusions by consensus. The group included three private citizens who are electric vehicle owners. We think the bill represents good policy arrived at through a good procedure. We heartily encourage you to vote for Bill 180218. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Larry Spector. Commenting on 180218. Morning. Thank you, Council President Clark, uh, members of City Council, and especially uh, our district, my district, Councilman Mark Squila, and Councilman David O. My name is Larry Spector. I appear on behalf of the Society Hill Civic Association. Uh, this is an association which has 5,000 residents uh, represented who live within boundaries of Delaware River to 8th Street, from Walnut to Lombard Street. Uh, we strongly support the phasing out of the current electronic electric vehicle parking program and the recommendations that were made by the task force. We think that those recommendations provide an excellent roadmap for parking for public electrical vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, currently, the curbside charging stations are not scalable and they're not even accessible to many people. So the bill will end the practice of giving an exclusive parking space to homeowners who have these parking permits. Uh, our neighborhood in particular has a disproportionate number of the permits that have been issued under these programs, but uh, the elimination of the program will end the exclusivity that homeowners have for the spaces by codifying two-hour parking for all vehicles uh, between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. and allowing electric charging uh, to continue from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. For, still for the homeowners. Uh, and the homeowners will have 15 years uh, during the sunset phase of this bill uh, to be able to continue to charge their cars. Uh, the program will stop what we see as sometimes the ad hoc installation of these charging stations that take up valuable places on the public sidewalks and have even been a tripping hazard for some residents of Society Hill. Uh, in conclusion, the Society Hill Civic Association strongly supports the work, the excellent work of the task force and its recommendations and the general direction in which this whole venture of electric charging of vehicles is going. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Helen Evalev. Commenting on 180322. Morning. Thank you for giving me 
giving us this opportunity to speak to you about a critical issue, one that looms over all of us, the universal peril of nuclear weapons and what that means for our children and grandchildren. In our wars, there are different, our wars are fought differently today. In our wars since World War II, the casualties have been 90% civilian and 10% combatants. Nuclear weapons are designed for one thing, to wipe out whole populations. And they would also dramatically alter the climate in ways so catastrophic that they are frankly beyond imagining. This issue is not new to Philadelphia, and I wish to speak to the local precedents. Few of you may recall, Philadelphia was an active center with its Quaker history of getting a nuclear freeze referendum on the ballot nationally. The referendum called for the United States and Russia, the new, only nuclear powers at that time, to retain existing nuclear parity, halt the arms race, and open the way for eventual elimination of all nuclear weapons. The nuclear freeze referendum of 1982 was the largest referendum on a single issue in United States history and won by a landslide. It was on the ballot in 38 cities and I'm proud to say that Philadelphia was one of them and that we voted three to one for the referendum. Uh, that was yesterday. Today, nine nations have nuclear weapons, with the U.S. and Russia having 90% of them. The threat has grown with proliferation and with irresponsible and unpredictable leadership. Uh, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists has a clock that measures how close we are to nuclear war. The hands are now two minutes to midnight. They have only been this close once before during the confrontation with the Soviet uh, Union during the missile, Cuban Missile Crisis. Today we are here to plead for our grandchildren and children and to ask City Council to follow these precedences and make Philadelphia again a leader by exerting pressure on our congressmen and senators to co-sponsor companion legislation now languishing committee that prohibits the president from launching a first strike use of nuclear weapons without a declaration <coughs> of war by Congress. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Jean Haspel. Commenting on 180322. Uh, we thank you, the Granny Peace Brigade thanks Council Member Helen Gim and Derek Green for introducing Resolu Resolution 180322. We also wish to thank the co sponsors, Council Member Parker, Council Member Reynolds Brown, and Council Member Greenlee. And we want to give a big shout out to Jordan Connell who seems to be a magician at making things happen. It means a lot to us that city council members are willing to stand with us as we call on our city to continue its precedent-setting precedent stand to call on Congress and pass the bills that will prevent an unpredictable president from yeah, taking yeah, unilateral yeah. action with a nuclear That's weapon. We all know the horror to humans and the environment that is caused, caused by the impact of a nuclear strike. We know less about the dollars and cents cost of such a strike. Nuclear weapons have two basic parts, the warhead or bomb and the delivery system. One typical nuclear warhead may cost as much as $53 million. Delivery system is more expensive. Depending on whether it goes by land or by submarine, it can cost as much as $200 million. Do the math. If one nuclear weapon were to be launched, the approximate cost could be as much as $253 million. 
everyone in this room could come up with a long list of things our city could do with even one third of $253 million. Thus, while some of you may think that the possible launch of a nuclear first strike is not relevant to our city, the financial implications are clear. The money could be better spent on schools, housing, infrastructure, health care, efforts to fight poverty, as well as those other items you all have on your wish list. According to the Union of Concerned Scientists, from where my figures come, the United States will spend some $250 billion on new nuclear warheads and delivery systems in the next few decades. That is roughly equal to 30 years of federal funding for Head Start children. We hope you agree it is time for our city to call on Congress to act. Thank you for your testimony. Um, hold on one second, Mr. Chair recognizes Councilman O'Neill. Mr. President, I ask permission to leave the chamber. Um, I won't be back for the meeting. I have uh, council business in my district. And I'd like to be voting it uh, aye on all bills and resolutions except for bill for resolution 180322. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. The record shall reflect that. Margarita Padin. Commenting on 180352 and 170678. Um, good morning. I'm here to support um, Council Member Reynolds Brown's um, 180352, urging Pennsylvania House of Representatives to reject House Bills 1659 and 2138, which would create stringent employment requirements for Pennsylvanians using SNAP and Medicaid benefits. Thank you. Um, as a recipient of SNAP and Medicaid benefits, and right now it's almost humanely impossible to comply with the present requirements, I don't see how it could be any more stringent. You know, when you receive these benefits, you've got two weeks to go to a career link and apply and receive employment with certain vendors that are contracted with the career link. And if you don't, you've got to do compulsory volunteer work, and when you're doing that, how can you pursue your employment if your eight hours a day are spent doing volunteer work? And also, if you're a union member, you can't work for the people that the career link has their contracts with to send you to, you know, majority poverty wages, because you have to work with contractors that are signatory to your union, and the only way for you to get these jobs is to be out there looking for work. So um, I don't see how it humanely would be possible to make these requirements any more stringent, so thank you very much. Okay. I'm also here in support of Council Member Maria Quinones Sanchez, um, 170678. Um, as a um, resident of Philadelphia, um, I appreciate any efforts um, for affordable housing. Um, the majority of people that work really hard making poverty wages need a place to live. And I'm a, you know, I live in a neighborhood where we have affordable housing and we also have the, the highest um, rising um, market rate housing in the area, so it seems to be able to coexist, but working people need a place to live. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Claire, could you read the name of our next speaker, please? Joe Danahel, commenting on 180303, 180353, and 180004. This is the official decree of the people of Ray Mandamus Quo Warto, and as such requires immediate action remedy. Every week, council, mayor, and others transfer private property to government, probably illegally. Last week, Councilman Dom spoke on the responsibility to pay property taxes. He stated that the government cannot pay its bills without people performing their obligation to pay their taxes. What about the 
government obligation to pay just compensation and expenses for my stolen home. Since all were not paid with the federal HUD monies, how can mayor, council preach to Starbucks that officials are committed to equity and fairness? Constitutional laws require compensation that a well-informed donor would accept as well as reimbursed losses and expenses to be paid. Why has no official demanded investigation and prosecution of how my home was stolen without compensation, due process, or Seventh Amendment trial by jury in a clear RICO-style conspiracy to deny rights? The Constitution's require immediate remedy of this breach of law, breach of clause, breach of fiduciary duty. Your oath of office requires you to act or face prison. 42 U.S.C. 1982, 1983, 1985, 1986, 1987. 18 U.S.C. 241, 242, 23 A1, 23 A4. PA Constitution, Article 1, Sections 1 through 11. 26 PA, CSA, 703, 705, 708, 709, 712, 713, 716, and other laws listed in SCOTUS. 158965, 414130, 144056 appear violated. I call for the federal and commonwealth governments to perform their constitutional obligations to investigate and prosecute all involved in the theft and the legal deed transfer of my home, 1038 West Wyoming Avenue. The denial of God given 42 U.S.C. 1982 property rights for 20 four years is egregious, extraordinary, oath-violating, and requires immediate remedy. A just government must obey the rule of law. This color of law government must have its charter government revoked until a constitutionally compliant government is installed. Public servants cannot refuse their sworn duty to act any more than a fireman can refuse to fight a fire. The sovereign people require oath constitution laws be enforced. Jail is required for all who violate oath, constitution, or law. I remind counsel, it takes a lot of cooperation to create and allow monumental corruption. Thank you, Clerk. Would you please read the name for the next testimony, please? Liam Doherty. Liam Doherty. Council members, um, and th and thank you for letting me speak. Um, I'm uh, here to um, show my support for the unfair rental practices bill introduced by uh, council members St. Jones, Parker, and Kim. Um, I um, I have a disability and I work at Liberty Resources. Um, we are a center for independent living uh, down the street on Art. Um, and I want to say on behalf of the disability community, just cause eviction legislation um, is essential for us. Um, not only is it, um, uh, you know, sort of unbelievable that this city doesn't have such legislation right now. Um, it takes people with disabilities months, um, sometimes years, to find housing. Um, and we cannot afford to, um, you know, be on our own and live without. Um, right now, I'm um, in my building I rent, um, and my wife is eight months pregnant, um, and our building is being sold to another landlord. Um, and the way things are right now, um, they can very easily not um, accept my, my new lease, and I would be... Um, tr trying to look for a new place to live uh, with a with, uh, four-month-old baby. Um, and uh, that's not something I can do. Um, and it took me about a year, six months to a year, to find this current apartment that I'm in. Um, so 
again, uh, thank you for, for hearing me and for int introducing this film. And um, I, um, I appreciate the time. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Samantha Petty. Commenting on 170854. Hello, thank you for Morning. letting me speak today. I'm here about the same bill as the last speaker, uh, requiring good cause for certain residential evictions and to provide a first option for existing tenants to renew a lease. I'd first like to thank City Council for its current focus on affordable housing and eviction prevention. There's been a lot of action around that in a lot of different ways, and that's very meaningful to the City of Philadelphia. On this bill specifically, I'm here as a mom of a medically complex child. It takes us a very long time to find housing that's on one floor and has an elevator for my child's wheelchair and medical equipment. I do not personally fear eviction. I am quite economically stable. I have a lot of educational access and white privilege that allows me to not let my landlord intimidate me when I ask for reasonable accommodations for my child. But I'd like to represent my child's classmates today and their families who do not have the same access that I do and are often intimidated by their landlords and evicted without any cause given. Eviction in our city affects one out of 14 Philadelphia renters. I believe it's a poverty issue because it causes poverty. It's not just a symptom of not being able to cause, pay your rent. It's a fair housing issue because it disproportionately affects women of color and children. And those are classes protected under fair housing law. It's also a big public health issue for children like mine and also other children who are moved into substandard housing when their parents have evictions on their record and reasonable landlords do not want to rent to people with recent evictions on their record. I'm really proud of our efforts in early education. I work in that sector as a peer specialist for other parents of kids with disabilities. And I can't tell you how many kids we lose track of every week because their parents are evicted and we can't give them services because we can't find them again because the evictions happen so quickly. The parents don't have time to contact us and set up a new place for us to meet their homes, kids and provide services in their homes. We are <laughs> facing cuts federally for protections to fair housing. The most recent HUD budget does no longer allows us to use federal dollars to affirmatively further fair housing. This is a very important part of our job as a city and I think we can step up locally and passing good cause evictions means that we will protect fair housing for our citizens. And finally, I think good policy supports other existing policy and that this change will support the $500,000 budget recently won by Council for Eviction Court and our beverage tax that helps with early education and keeping our kids stable and educated. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Aki Raw. Commenting on 170854. Morning. Good morning. How you doing, Councilman Clark? Ladies and gentlemen, put this up here. I'm here to speak on behalf of not only the family of David Jones, also the family of all children I, I, I murdered in the streets of I, Philadelphia. I, I, Starbucks is not more dangerous than a racist police officer. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, can you, no, Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, no, if you could, if you do me a favor. No, your time, you got to start talking about, you signed up for evictions. No, but I'm just telling you, you got to, if you want to talk about evictions, you can start that process. The mic. Cut the mic. Let's cut the mic. All right. All right. We can talk about that later. I can. I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you. Yes, sir. 
we'll talk right after council. <clears throat> Next. There are no other speakers on the public comment list, Mr. President. Thank you. That concludes our public comment session. We're going to move on to our calendar. I'll talk to you. Calendar. Ready? All right. <clears throat> Mr. Decker, please read the title of. We're going to do that first? Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to do the consent agenda. <clears throat> we're going to consider the consent agenda first. I would ask Mr. Decker to please read the titles of all the bills on the consent agenda. After each title is read, any member may object to the inclusion of the bill on the consent agenda. Upon such an objection, and without debate, the bill will be immediately removed from the consent agenda and placed on our regular final passes calendar. Mr. Decker, you can please, please read the titles of the bills on the consent agenda. Bill number 180003 entitled an ordinance to amend the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designations of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by Gerard Avenue, 5th Street, Spring Garden Street, 8th Street, Brown Street, and 9th Street. And bill number 180099 entitled an ordinance to amend the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designations of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by Master Street, 28th Street, Thompson Street, and 27th Street. And bill number 180169 entitled an ordinance amending Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code and Title Zoning and Planning by revising Chapter 14700 entitled Development Standards by creating regulations for semi detached structures and making related changes. And bill number 180172 entitled an ordinance to amend the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designations of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by Oakmont Street, Torresdale Avenue, Pennypack Creek, Ron Street, and Rowland Avenue. Mm -hmm. And bill number 180173 entitled an ordinance to amend the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing Changing the zoning designations of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by Sheffield Avenue, Leon Street, Sally Avenue, Frankfurt Avenue, Stanwood Street, and Erdrick Street. And bill number 170925 entitled an ordinance terminating a no parking regulation on Ivy Hill Road between Mansfield Avenue and Hazelwood Drive, Northeast Entrance, South Side. And bill number 170926 entitled an ordinance establishing a one way regulation on Hazelwood Drive at Ivy Hill Road. And bill number 171117 entitled an ordinance establishing a no truck parking regulation on both sides of 75th Street from Brockton Road to Lansdowne Avenue. And bill number 180004 entitled an ordinance legalizing an existing retaining wall encroachment at 289 Osborne Street. And bill number 180079 entitled an ordinance amending Chapter 9200 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Commercial Activities on Streets by amending Section 9204 entitled Sidewalk Vendors in Center City to change certain requirements for vending licenses and the process for obtaining locations for Center City sidewalk vending. And bill number 180080 entitled an ordinance ordinance authorizing the relocation of the lines and the striking and abandonment of certain portions of a right of way reserved for drainage purposes and water main purposes extending from Mead Street to Gravers Lane, southwest of Shawnee Street on city plan number 165, thereby reducing the width of said right of way. 
And bill number 180102, entitled an ordinance amending section 9205 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled sidewalk sales, by prohibiting vending on both sides of Haverford Avenue between Brookhaven Road and Lansdowne Avenue. And bill number 180179, entitled an ordinance amending section 9205 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled sidewalk sales, by exempting sidewalk sales by owners and tenants of properties on both sides of 22nd Street between Lehigh Avenue and Allegheny Avenue, and by permitting such activity under certain terms and conditions. And bill number 180216, entitled an ordinance authorizing Timothy McGurriman of St. Joseph's University to construct, own, and maintain a proposed sidewalk cafe and planter's encroachment at 2461 through 81 North 54th Street. And bill number 180218, entitled an ordinance amending section 12, 1131 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled electric vehicle parking, to provide for the discontinued approval of new electric vehicle parking spaces and the expiration of such existing spaces. And bill number 180262, entitled an ordinance amending section 12701 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled Bicycle Lanes, by authorizing the Department of Streets to designate bicycle lanes in both directions on Parkside Avenue from North 53rd Street to Bryn Mawr Avenue, and authorizing the removal of travel lanes in the same limits. And bill number 180263, entitled an ordinance amending section 12701 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled Bicycle Lanes, by authorizing the Department of Streets to designate bicycle lanes in both directions on Lansdowne Drive, and South Concourse Drive from Sweetbriar Drive to 41st Street Drive in Fairmount Park and authorizing the removal of parking pursuant to section 12203 on both Lansdowne Drive and South Concourse Drive in the same limits, all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you, Mr. Decker. These bills have been read on two different days. The question for each bill now, shall the bill pass finally? Mr. Decker will call a roll and upon being called, each council member shall vote aye on each of the bills, nay on each of the bills, or indicate those bills for which the member is voting aye and those bills for which the member is voting nay. Mr. Decker, please call the roll. Councilwoman Bass. Councilwoman Blackwell. Aye. Councilman Dom. Aye. Councilman Green. Aye. Councilman Greenlee. Aye. Councilwoman Gim. Councilman Heenan. Aye. Councilman Johnson. Aye. Aye. Councilman Jones is not present. Councilman O'Neill is voting aye on all bills. Councilman O. Aye. Councilwoman Parker. Aye. Councilwoman Cunanez Sanchez. Aye. Councilwoman Reynolds Brown. Aye. Councilman Squilla. Aye. Councilman Taubenberger. Council President Clark. Aye on all bills. The majority of all members have been voting in the affirmative for each of the bills. The bills on the consent agenda are passed. We will now consider the bills and resolutions on a regular second reading and final passes calendar. Mr. Decker, please read the title of 180303. A resolution authorizing the Philadelphia Land Bank to dispose of 1936 North Marshall Street located in the 5th Councilmanic District. Chair recognizes Councilman Greenlee. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the adoption of the resolution. Thank you. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Resolution 180303 is adopted. Mr. Decker, 180-322. A resolution urging Congress to pass H.R. 669 and S-200, the Restricting First Use of Nuclear Weapons Act of 2017, <coughs> which pro would prohibit the President of the United States from launching a nuclear first strike without a congressional declaration of war. Chair recognizes Councilwoman again. Thank you very much, Council President. I move for the adoption of the resolution. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Let the record reflect that Councilman O, Councilman Taubenberger, and Councilman O'Neill are voting nay. Uh, resolution 180-322 is adopted. Mr. Decker, 180-352. A resolution urging the Pennsylvania House of Representatives to reject House Bills 1659 and 2138, which would create stringent employment requirements for Pennsylvanians using SNAP and Medicaid benefits. Chair recognizes Councilwoman Reynolds Brown. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the adoption. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Resolution 180352 is adopted. Mr. Decker, 
180353. A resolution approving the redevelopment contract of the Philadelphia Redevelopment Authority for the redevelopment and urban renewal of a portion of the Model City's urban renewal area identified by house numbers and street addresses as 1029 through 1031 Mount Vernon Street and 1028 Lemon Street. Chair recognizes Councilman Greenlee. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the adoption of the resolution. Second. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Uh, let's have it. Resolution 180353. Councilman Taubenberger, did you need to be yes, recognized? Yes. In, in my uh, quick absence, the uh, consent agenda was, was voted upon, and I would like to be recorded voting aye on all bills. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. The record, the record shall reflect that. Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Decker, 180356. A resolution urging the U.S. Department of Treasury to help protect access to banking services in lower income communities by declining to adopt harmful proposed changes to, commu to Community Reinvestment Act regulations. Chair recognizes Councilman Johnson. Council President, I move for the adoption of the resolution. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Resolution 180356 is adopted. Mr. Decker, 180-121. A resolution appointing Adam Tetteris to the Board of Directors for the Old City Special Services District. Chair recognizes Councilman Squilla. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the adoption. Second. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Resolution 180-121 is adopted. Mr. Decker, 180-122. A resolution appointing Donnell McCoy to the Board of Directors for the Old City Special Services District. Chair recognizes Councilman Squilla. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the adoption of the resolution. It's been moved and probably second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Resolution 180-122 is adopted. Mr. Decker, 180-147. A resolution confirming the appointment of Marcel S. Pratt Esquire as City Solicitor. <coughs> Chair recognizes Councilman Heenan. Move for the resolution. Second. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Resolution 180-147 is adopted. Mr. Decker, do you have any additional resolutions? A resolution recognizing April 22, 2018 as Earth Day in the city of Philadelphia, introduced by Councilwoman Reynolds-Brown. Chair recognizes Councilwoman Reynolds-Brown. President, I move for the adoption. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? I have it. That resolution is adopted. And a resolution authorizing the Committee on Labor and Civil Service to hold hearings on the effectiveness of implicit bias and racial equity trainings for employees of the City of Philadelphia, introduced by Councilwoman Reynolds-Brown. Chair again recognizes Councilwoman Reynolds-Brown. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the adoption. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, I have it. That resolution is adopted. And a resolution rec recognizing April 26, 2018 as 5050 Day in the City of Philadelphia, introduced by Councilwoman Reynolds Brown. Here, one more time, recognizes Councilwoman Reynolds Brown. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the adoption. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, I have it. And that resolution is adopted. And a resolution authorizing the Committee on Appropriations and the Committee on Transportation and Public Utilities to conduct hearings to develop more inclusive, transparent, and efficient processes and methods for the City of Philadelphia's procurement of professional services, capital programs, and commodities. Introduced by Councilwoman Cunha Sanchez. Chair recognizes Councilwoman Cunha Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for its adoption. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. That resolution is adopted. And a resolution proclaiming the week of April 27, 2018 to May 5, 2018 as the 8th Annual Philly Tech Week presented by Comcast and honoring the broad and vibrant Philadelphia technology community introduced by Councilman O. Chair recognize Councilman O. Thank you. I move for the adoption of the resolution. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. That resolution is adopted. And a resolution recognizing May 2018 as Asian American and Pacific Islanders Heritage Month in Philadelphia to celebrate and commemorate the proud heritage of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and their important contributions to enhancing the city's culture, economy, and the founding ideals of independence and democracy introduced by Councilman O. Chair again recognize Councilman O. Thank you very much. On, on, on uh, my behalf, on behalf of uh, Councilwoman Helen Gim, I move for adoption of the resolution. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. That resolution is adopted. And a resolution commemorating the 60th anniversary of the death of In Ho O oh and the response of his, by his parents of offering forgiveness to the teenage murderers, requesting that the juveniles receive the most generous treatment possible, allowed by law, and establishing a fund to be used for their religious, educational, vocational, and social guidance. Introduced by Councilman O. Oh. 
Chair again recognizes Councilman O. Thank you. With appreciation to Councilman Janie Blackwell, I move for the option of the resolution. It's been moved to property second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. That resolution is adopted. There are no other resolutions on the final passage calendar, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Are there any speeches on the behalf of the minority? Chair recognizes Councilman O. Thank you very much, Council President. There, there have been a lot of issues that have faced the city, and um, uh, fortunately the media has reported on it, and uh, I appreciate all the council members who have been very actively engaged. Uh, I would like to talk about something, however, that, uh, um, that uh, I came across uh, uh, last week. Um, while I was away, a, a woman came and left me a booklet, and it was about her son, uh, his name is Eric Mann. And uh, I agreed to meet her, uh, but she wanted me to read the booklet, and I did read the booklet, and it reminded me of something that I had experienced many years ago as an attorney, and that is when I came across Pennsylvania's Post-Conviction Relief Act. And I'd like to talk a little bit about it because uh, I will introduce a resolution next week calling upon the state legislature to amend and reform this act. I have asked my staff to contact uh, Harrisburg. I will go visit them. Uh, the first page of the book that she left me, uh, which is evidence of proof of innocence, is an opinion written by Justice James Fitzgerald, who was specially assigned to Superior Court. And he wrote in concurrence or agreement with the decision that the law was being followed, but this is what he said. He said, I write separately only to express my utmost displeasure with the Post-Conviction Relief Act's failure to facilitate justice in this case where it is clear to all that it is likely that an innocent man sits behind bars for no better reason than a poorly conceived statute. No system of criminal justice is perfect. However, a system of criminal justice that prevents the correction of obvious errors is easily improved if only the legislature could see fit to do it. This case, in summary, is about a man who was accused of uh, shooting from a terrorist uh, another man. Uh, a witness, a single witness, said he saw him from a terrorist shoot downward and kill the man. Uh, at, at the hearing, there were three alibi witnesses sitting in court, but the attorney never called them to testify. And later, many years later after the conviction, it was found that likely the defense attorney never filed notice to the prosecution that they had an alibi witness and therefore could not present the alibi witness. Since that time, the single eyewitness recanted, saying that he did not tell the truth. But the most critical thing for me is scientific evidence that two different weapons were used, a 22 caliber weapon and a 32 caliber weapon, firing horizontally and from down to up. It would be scientifically impossible for the person on the terrace to have shot the, 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 the bullets that killed this person. He has spent 26 years in jail. Here is the problem with, the, with Pennsylvania's Post-Conviction Re Relief Act. Uh, and I did run into this decades ago. Um, and fortunately for the person I represented uh, in a very long process through a writ of habeas corpus in the federal court, the evidence against him was found to be unreliable and he was set free. The problem is that once a person is found guilty in Pennsylvania and the appeals are exhausted, uh, a, a defendant may file post-conviction relief and there are limited grounds. Ineffective assistance of counsel is one, newly discovered evidence is the other. However, you have to file within a year, and uh, if you have newly discovered evidence, you have to file within 60 days of the knowledge of that evidence. That may sound simple enough, but in Pennsylvania, the, the standards are too strict. They're too hard. It's hard to overcome these standards because for, for ineffective assistance of counsel, it is different than medical malpractice. The standard is that no competent attorney would have done what the attorney did in either 
in particularly excluding or not including evidence of innocence. And th that evidence has to be of a certain category. And therefore, if an attorney committed malpractice, what I would say is malpractice, uh, that will not provide the defendant an opportunity to have his case heard or the evidence heard. The other issue is that in Pennsylvania, newly discovered evidence is not evidence that you just find. It's evidence that you should have found, could have found, but didn't find. And in Pennsylvania, no matter how poorly represented you are, how illogically you are represented, how terribly you're represented, as long as your lawyer told you what he was going to do, and most people rely on their lawyers, you don't have an appealable basis. Um, I think that the Pennsylvania Post-Conviction Relief Act needs to be amended so that people who have evidence newly discovered evidence, scientific edit evidence, recanting of evidence, evidence of attorney malpractice can appeal and present their evidence because the way it is right now, it is just uh, nearly impossible in our state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Speeches on behalf of the majority, Chair recognizes Councilwoman Reynolds Brown. Thank you, Mr. President. I have uh, two, one announcement and remarks I wish to make. First, uh, my favorite writer, Maya Angelou, once remarked, quote, Sex, success is loving life and daring to live it. I rise this morning to inform my colleagues and staff that uh, Hania Sharp Brown, for the last two years, has loved her work in our office, but has dared to live life and move on. She's been offered an made an offer she cannot refuse, a career opportunity she cannot refuse, and has chosen to move on and make another corner of the world distinctively hers. So I want all to join me in saying thank you to Hania Sharp Brown. <laughs> Secondly, Mr. President, on a, a personal but also a very professional note, uh, Councilman Good has always been my leader, my teacher, my hero when it comes to any and all issues that remotely touch the song known as diversity and inclusion. This morning, I, along with Councilman Kenyatta Johnson and chair of the committee on, what's that committee? Help me out. Labor and Civil Service, Councilman Sherelle Parker, uh, coupled with co-sponsorship by members Gim and Green, have also a resolution because given the song we've been singing for the last uh, 20 plus years, uh, diversity and inclusion is still not well in the city of Philadelphia. The expulsion, arrest, and detainment of two African American men at Starbucks in Philadelphia last week never should have happened. We know that discrimination amongst black and brown people, women, happens all the time. It happens because this country suffers from a history of inequality and racism, from slavery to Jim Crow. It happens because the biases and stereotypes created in our history, like the movie Birth of a Nation, still live with us today profoundly. It is because of this history that we end up with a neighborhood where Two Af where African Americans are 3% of the residents. Let me repeat that. African Americans are 3% of the residents, yet 67% of the police stop and frisk, according to the ACLU. So I join many across the city and quite frankly around the country, but locally a number of institutions, including our own city of Philadelphia and Starbucks and other companies who take full responsibility to not only acknowledge the power of these biases and stereotypes, but more importantly, to work actively through equitable hiring and advancement practices, modernized policies and procedures. We need to look at how well we're not doing uh, in this area. So clearly, it is now, now time for City Council and the City of Philadelphia to again lead by example by doing two things. Let's first evaluate best practices that work look to see how effective 
they are with regards to trainings in the area of implicit bias and racial equity, and then look to see what we can adopt as a city so that we can lead by example uh, from this day going forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilwoman. Chair recognizes Councilman Johnson. Thank you, Council President. And I want to also thank my colleague, Councilman Blano Reynolds Brown, for staying on the case and I'm stepping up to the plate with my other fellow council members uh, with me last week in the second councilmatic district um, as we addressed the issue of racial profiling in the Starbucks Cafe at 18th and Spruce Streets. Um, by this point, I think we're all aware of the racial profiling incident that took place last week with two African-American young men at the Starbucks located at 18th and Spruce Streets were arrested. If you had told me a week ago I, I'd meet the founder of Starbucks this week as a result of racial profiling in the second councilmanic district, I probably wouldn't have believed you. Nevertheless, here we are. Privately, I've met with members of the local Starbucks team, including the founder of the company, Howard Schultz, to address the issues and concerns regarding to my constituents. I have to personally commend their executives for showing up in person and listening to what people have to say and taking steps pretty immediately to address racial profiling in their stores. My fellow council members and myself and advocates stood outside on the corner of 18th and the Spruce Streets and demanded an apology and also expected and also addressed the issue of beyond just an apology for Starbucks to take seriously by addressing the issue of sensitivity training in their stores. Because we have come along, because we have come to learn that this is not an isolated incident only in the city of Philadelphia. In the last two days, the company has announced it will close 8,000 stores on the afternoon of May the 29th for what they call unconscious bias training. This is a, a step in the right direction in Philadelphia and across the country but to me, I must personally say, it's not enough. The company has the work to do here in the city of Philadelphia to regain the trust of customers and restore their brand image it portrays as a welcoming environment for people to meet up and hang outside, hang inside their establishment. The two young men affected, Rashawn Nelson and Dante Robinson, have spoken out publicly for the first time this morning, offering their perspective on the event and also asking to be a part of clear policy changes. Those two young men have, have experienced a deep level of trauma as a result of being arrested for doing nothing. We will continue to have conversations with local residents and the company leadership to see what more can be done moving forward to ensure all of, their, all of our citizens feel welcome in the Starbucks Cafe. We need to be sure that there are clear policies uniformly applied across the board for everyone to adhere to and that employees are not set up to use their discretion for failure. However, even more, we need to engage with the Philadelphia Police Department to work to improve community and police relations. Most of you may or may most of you know that police have a tremendous amount of discretion and have the opportunity to make decisions on the, on the drop of a dime, rather if they would like to arrest someone or if not, you can look on social media on any, any given day and any given time and see officers engaging in their level of discretion when it comes to if they would like to arrest someone or not regarding to the circumstances of the issue at hand. Um, I will be meeting with Commissioner Ross um, to address um, their, the Philadelphia Police Department's policies regarding rules of engagement as well as when is discretion used and how is that discretion used and also looking at the issue of uh, racial profiling particularly in the second councilmanic district as the figures which that were released by ACLU were just mentioned by my colleague, Councilman Blondell Reynolds Brown. I want to thank the customers and advocates who documented this incident and brought national media attention to this issue. As a city, we're in a unique position now that we weren't in last week to have a real conversation and open up a dialogue about racial profiling in our city and what it looks like in 2018. There's an international spotlight on Philadelphia right now documenting how we handle this, whether we like it or not. And on our police department and the Starbucks Corporation, telling the story of race relations in America. 
Hopefully we can use this as a platform where we want to continue to advocate for a better way of handling situations in public and private spaces and show the world how Philadelphia will go about implementing real change and making progress as it relates to relations. I am encouraged by the positive steps we're taking right now, and they are significant, but as I mentioned before, it's not enough. Again, I want to thank my colleagues for, um, over this last few weeks, I mean, over this last week, just being supportive and, and having a dialogue and conversing with me about the various ways in approaching this issue. And Council President, thank you for your time. Thank you, Councilman. Chair, recognize Councilwoman Blackwell. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me say that I'm proud of, and I certainly agree with Councilwoman Blondell Reynolds Brown and <clears throat> Councilman Kenyatta Johnson. Uh, let me also say that I want to thank and agree with Councilman O about what he's saying, and we're proud to support anything we can do to support him in what he says about making the law fairer for people who've been incarcerated. Uh, finally, I wanted to say to all those who listen, please make sure that April, the end of April is coming soon on our parking amnesty program. Please make sure you take advantage of it. We have already brought in 1430295 dollars with cash payments and payment plans. We brought that into the city with this amnesty plan. So please, John and Jane Q. Public, please come forward, take advantage of this, because the end of April is coming soon. We said they should extend it another 30 days, but of course we can't get that. We did try. So uh, do what you can to let your people know. Time's running short, and, that, uh, and we're so happy. People didn't agree with this, but bringing in one and a half million dollars already certainly makes a big difference. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilwoman Keona Sanchez. Thank you. I want to remind folks that we have an LNI hearing um, scheduled for one. We will delay that to 115, given um, where we are right now. Um, it's important to note the uh, intersectionality of some of the issues that we talk about, and I definitely want to join Councilwoman Reynolds Brown in speaking of the work that Wilson Good to hear did here in council around inclusion and how all these things come together. Um, I personally want to uh, thank you, Council President, for uh, the RFP on the OPA assessments. You know, as we're in the middle of this budget discussion, it's very important, definitely as Chair of Appropriations, that we really demonstrate to folks that we're being good stewards uh, of their money. Um, last year, I introduced a bill to review the state code and the matrix by which assessments are conducted in the city of Philadelphia. And the law clearly stipulates that we cannot use unrealized value of abatements so that we don't overvalue, overassess, and overburden longtime residents. Last week, Councilman Johnson introduced a resolution, and we'll work jointly on that public discussion that's so very important. And, and clearly, your RFP is complementary to that work. Today, um, along with Councilman Johnson and uh, Councilman Green, Councilwoman Blackwell, Councilman Jones, uh, Councilwoman Bass, and, and Bl Reynolds Brown, we are calling for another public discussion that we believe is extremely timely uh, about our capital uh, and professional uh, contracting for the city of Philadelphia, not only in the general fund, but also in our enterprise funds. In our public discussions over the last couple of weeks, it's alarming that we don't have articulated standards and that departments have a lot of discretion and individually develop RFPs, how they award contracts, um, whether it's the lowest responsible bidder, best values as it gets incorporated, but the level of discretion um, is concerning. It's further alarming that our numbers are, are, are decreasing given the mayor's public commitment to inclusion and, get this, and council's work around this issue. That's why I think it's necessary for us to have a very public discussion about and develop standards that hold contractors and vendors responsible to meet their participation goals. Ultimately, if we don't debar and fire people, they're not going to take us serious. But more importantly, that we hold the res uh, departments responsible to reach the goals because we are talking about a five-year, $10.8 billion capital fund, 
And when you look at our enterprise funds, such as the water department at $4.8 billion, we got to show people, not just tell people, that we're being responsible. And I look forward to that public discussion, as we've always had in council, um, to bring added value and added discussion within, within the administration and council on these important issues. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilwoman. Chair recognizes Councilwoman Bass. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to take a moment to invite everyone over to the caucus room. I know we have a lot happening today after session, but I wanted to invite everyone over to the caucus room immediately after session for a lunch briefing on community health choices. And this is Pennsylvania's new mandatory managed care program for individuals who are eligible for both medical assistance and Medicare, older adults and individuals with physical disabilities. The, this program has been rolling out across the state since the begin, beginning of this year and will go into effect in Philadelphia next January. And it's going to have a significant impact. It's going to impact thousands of our residents, many of whom may either be unaware of the change or have concerns about these changes and what it can mean for their health care. So we certainly hope folks can come over after the uh, session and get some valuable information that can be shared with all of our constituents. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilwoman. Chair recognizes Councilman Don. Thank you, <clears throat> Council President. Um, this week we remembered the six million Jews killed in concentration camps during World War II. My grandfather came here in 1915. He was one of nine. My eight aunts and uh, uncles were all killed in concentration camps. So were my great-grandparents. So were their children, including a two-year-old. Everyone was perished except my uh, grandfather. No one spoke for them. The world was silent. No one spoke. I see what happened this past week in Philadelphia, and I'm glad that we do speak for people who need our voice. That's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Councilman. Um, there are no additional speeches on behalf of the minority and majority. And with that, Chair recognizes Councilman Greenlee for a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the council stay in adjourn until Thursday, April 26, 2018, at 10 a.m. Thank you. This has been moved and probably second. The council stay in adjourn until Thursday, April 26, 2018, at 10 a.m. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. Thank you all very much.